We are here with stand-up comedian Ida Rodriguez for Comedy High Plus. Ida, thank you so much for your time. My name is Tina Sampe, also known as Slauson Girl. I'm a journalist from South Central, and I'm excited to have a conversation with you today. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me, and I'm excited to be having a conversation with you because you post pertinent news and things that really affect the community that other news outlets don't. And I appreciate you supporting me also. Thank you. Yeah, most definitely. Um, so I'm really interested to talk to you because, you know, I'm somebody that majored in like race and gender studies. And, you know, your comedy yeah. is hitting along the lines of race and identity. So it's always really good to talk to people that have the context for the conversation. Right. Yeah. Um, because that really allows, you know, conversations to flow without people getting defensive. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, yeah. So within that, um, you know, your comedy is very personal and transparent, especially concerning racial dynamics. Yeah. How did your family first respond to you as a comedian, especially your parents? So, you know, I just met my father uh, maybe two years ago. So um, it was interesting to hear his perspective. My mom is my biggest like hype person. My mom watches all my videos. My mother um, laughs at my jokes. She comes, you know, she really enjoys this part of me. She didn't understand it at the beginning, if I'm honest. You know, how was I going to make a living? Um, what was I doing? You know, I was a grown up with two kids and she was like, what are you going to do? But um, as soon as, um, you know, I started informing her and educating her on what it what it really was. And she started embracing it and she's become quite the cheerleader. Um, and, you know, as far as me telling my story, she's been very supportive of that because it's my it's my life and my journey. And, you know, she's had her own, I think, her own reckoning within it and her own levels of dealing with guilt because finally hearing a lot of the stuff that I felt as a child and her not being able to rescue me from it kind of made her feel a little bit bad about it. But I think it's healthy to be honest and have these conversations. Were you outspoken as a kid? No, I was really mousy. Um, I was very quiet. Um, you know, I was, I was always in situations that were bigger than me in terms of, I was exposed to a lot of stuff that children normally are not exposed to because I was a translator from my grandmother, because I, um, I was just in in spaces that little kids probably wouldn't be in. So um, I had a lot of anxiety and I was really, really quiet and mousy. I didn't really start um, talking and, and becoming more vocal and, and more outgoing until I was maybe like 11, mm -hmm. 12 is when I started. I had a fifth grade teacher who I always speak about. Uh, Miss Miss Sylvia Rowe, who passed away, unfortunately. And um, so when I was in elementary school, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, all my teachers were dark-skinned Black women. And they became my standard of beauty because Miss Rowe was like the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. Mm -hmm. And then I thought Thelma on Good Times was like the epitome of beauty. Mm -hmm. um, my uncles were of, dar of a darker hue, which all the girls really all were always chasing them. So my perspective about what beautiful was, was very different than what was out in the world. Right. And that it was when I encountered other people that it was challenged. Mm -hmm. So I really felt like um, I, I, I had this teacher that was very, um, she, I was tall and she would always make me stand up straight, look her in the eye when I talked to her. She instilled a lot of confidence in me and she was like a woman that was completely different than my mother because she was a working woman. She was an educator. She was beautiful and strong. And my mom is a beautiful lady, but it was just a very different type of thing. And I think that's where my confidence started to build, you mm. know, and Miss um, Carter, my sixth grade teacher was like, I want you to sing in this thing. I want you to perform. Mm -hmm. They really, I had a Miss Funches. Like, I hope they see this because I don't, I don't ever know if these teachers know the impact that they have on children. Right. You know what I mean? But I had these beautiful, amazing teachers that became like my, that's why I spent most of my time, right? I, you're in school like eight hours and 
that's when I really started to blossom mm -hmm. when I was around them. All my teachers were white before them and it was a different experience. That's really powerful because, mm -hmm. you know, as you mentioned, you know, in America, the typical standard of beauty isn't um, a dark skinned person or a, really a black person. I know things are changing now, um, you mm -hmm. know, thanks to social media, we're getting exposed to, mm -hmm. you know, um, different aspects of of beauty and representation. But I think that that's just really powerful. And just thank you so much for sharing that. Um, oh, yeah, there was it was so I mean, that was where I learned to sit up straight, mm -hmm. hold your head up. You know, she would always tell me, she would be like, look at me in the eye when you're talking to me. Like, and she was like the most beautiful person I ever saw in my life. She's on my Instagram page because I was like, when I was, I was looking at this lady and I could see like men would come around, they would fawn over her. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, uh, I was very conscious of that because they, people would uh, do that to my mom. That lady was just so powerful, but they were all just so powerful women in my life. Like, I'm just so thankful that I encountered them because I was able to go into high school, Ms. D Eunice Davis, like these teachers, they they built me up and I was able to go into school and blossom and then and get out, you know, get out of there. Confidence is key, you know, especially um, in school, you know, a lot of kids confidence is shot, you know, mm -hmm. um, just because of, you know, kids could be mean, but um <laughs> I wanted to um, ask you, what city and state was this in? Miami, Florida. So you mentioned that you were a translator for your grandmother. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to kind of talk a bit about this because, you know, from the African-American community, those of us that um, do not come from the immigrant experience, mm -hmm. I don't think um, a lot of us kind of um, are in tune with the dynamics mm -hmm. of how important, you know, children that are born in the U.S., how important and um, they become to assist their parents or grandparents who don't necessarily speak the language. Mm -hmm. um, so can you just talk a little briefly about, you know, what kind of things were you assisting your grandmother with mm -hmm. as a translator? So, you know, it's funny. My grandmother was the landlady of a building oh. and um, she had tenants and some of the tenants didn't speak English. I mean, didn't speak Spanish and she didn't speak English. I also went to the doctor with her. And when I went to the doctor with her, that would range from the eye doctor to the gynecologist, which was very uncomfortable for me as a child. My grandmother had a lot of issues. She was part of the crop of women who were sterilized in Puerto Rico as part of those systemic issues. Um, so she had, you know, my grandmother had a full hysterectomy at the age of like 19 years old and she had, she had already had her children, but so uh, I had to learn a lot. Of, I, I learned a lot of stuff that I didn't want to know. I also had, there was a lot of addiction in my family. So uh, my grandmother was the matriarch of our family. So I was calling crisis, talking to them about coming to do a Baker Act, which is arresting a drug addict so that they won't hurt themselves and putting them in jail mm -hmm. in lieu of if they don't go to treatment. Mm -hmm. So I was really young and I knew what crisis was. I knew what a 5150 hold was. I knew what, you know, uh, detox was, was, what program was prison, going to jail to visit my, you know, my uncles. And my grandmother was at the center of all of it because she was the mother of all of these children and I was the translator. So I was, I was ex exposed to quite a, a bit, you know, in addition to arguing with police, having conversations with legal people, having conversations with um, in institutions, going to the electric company and people, you know, saying, being in the grocery store and a white lady asking me to ask my grandmother if, if a watermelon was ripe, if a banana was ripe, like things, those types of experiences that affect you because you don't really know what that means, but you know it's not, and you know it's off. Mm -hmm. And um, I was exposed to a lot of stuff at a very young age. And, you know, it's very common for many of us because they have to, they have to lean on us mm -hmm. because they can't trust outside of the circle. You know, uh, my grandmother was an undoc was not uh, was not an undocumented person because she was Puerto Rican and they're citizens. Mm -hmm. When you think about like the undocumented experience, you still you even in addition to that, you got to guard it because you don't you don't know who you can and cannot trust that can betray you and, you know, cause problems or whatever. So it was a lot. So let's talk a little bit about um, your identity as somebody who is Puerto Rican and Dominican and black. Um, so who's Puerto Rican and Dominican? And so they're all. So the funny thing is, my mom is Puerto Rican. My okay. my father's Dominican, 
And the blackness is in and out of all of it, right? Because right. we are all, the, my family is a spectrum. It's like my uncles, my mother, my mother is a lighter complexion woman and my her brother looks as, you know, he is as dark skinned as people would think that he was from other places, you know, West Africa or whatever, and he was Puerto Rican. So, um, you know, we evolve and I um, I would always identify as Afro-Latina. Um, and then I got pushed back from darker skin Afro-Latinos who were upset that people of lighter hues were taking the identity and, and erasing them within it. And because I am conscious of that, because the point of me is to create awareness of it, not to erase any one of it, um, I changed... Uh, I, I identify as Afro-Indigenous because I claim my African blood and I claim my indigenous blood. And I never have shied away from my blackness. You know, within my, my community, because this is newer, um, there is a, the spectrum of blackness has been, you know, it is a very sensitive conversation because within our community, there is an erasure of darker skinned black people. Right. And so in my uh, effort to bring awareness to it, I have to be conscious of that because even if I'm the one, if I become the Afro Latino, Latinx, Latin A spokesperson, that also sends a very complicated, confusing message because there are people way darker than me who don't get seen. Mm -hmm. And so for me as a person that wants to be, uh, an evolved person and be the best that I can be and always I, I'm, I'm championing this and talking about it I got to listen mm -hmm. and so you know I just I just felt comfortable being able to say I claim my black blood I claim my indigenous blood and this is what I am um, knowing that within my community that's most comfortable now you you and I both know that if I was African-American I would just be black because nobody is telling Sally Richardson or Zoe Kravitz that she can't claim, they can't claim their, I mean, I'm sure somebody is, but mm -hmm. they still are black people. Right. But that is so new to my community. I feel yeah. like it's just a very complicated space to exist in. And I don't want to, my aim is never to cause pain or confusion. Mm -hmm. It's to enlighten people about our, our full spectrum and using my privilege as a lighter skinned person of color to say, we get darker than this and they all belong to us. And so I just, my identity has evolved, you know, cause I feel like I also want to claim my, my indigenous blood. I think we should all do that. When I was in college, we was taking one class that we were taking um, or that I took was a U.S. Um, Mexico border class. So basically we were studying like all of the wars that happened along mm -hmm. like the U.S. Mexico border. And we were like way like in the 15 or 1400s mm -hmm. or something. And then I started to click to me. I was like, wow, like the Latino community kind, you know, basically is like, you know, have been colonized folks, you know, from um, Spaniards. But they're like, you know, they're indigenous folks yeah. that have been colonized by Spaniards, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And even with Spanish, you know, being, you know, it's kind of like a colonized language of course you know? yeah and so um I just think that that's like really interesting so you know I do appreciate you know Latino folks um that understand their history and are claiming their indigenous identity you know and I think that that's really important um one thing that I wanted to ask you was you know you you talked about blackness being erased in the Latino community um what do you think leads to that erasure it's all colonization. It's all self-hate. It's all ignorance. You know, what I really want to unpack is stop. We got to, uh, we, well, we ain't got to do anything, but the, the conversations around it is demonizing people. Like School Days is a movie about colorism that Spike Lee did. And within that, it is a very obvious that there is colorism within the black community where black people have done it to themselves you know, and each other, right. it's no different when other people do it. It's, it hurts because when an outsider does that to you, I mean, it's like when your cousin calls you ugly, but if somebody else calls you ugly, you're like, you want to fight that person. Mm -hmm. And I get it. But anti-blackness and white supremacy is something that has affected us globally. It right. is not just a regional thing. 
when you talk about people like from the Caribbean and Latin America whose media is constantly telling them that black people in America are violent and lazy. You know, it's this universal complex of media that services white supremacy, always sending bad messaging around people of color. Mm -hmm. Like when I went to Israel, people were scared that I was going to Palestine and I was like, I'm going to Palestine. And it's because the media always makes Palestinians seem like they're these violent, barbaric people. They're human beings that deserve to live a happy life and want to want you know want to exist peacefully and of course they have violent people just like they do in Israel and no different but I'm to deny the humanity of people in Palestine is to deny the people the humanity of people in Israel and I don't want to participate in any of that so when you think about Jamaica and Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic and this anti-Yankee sentiment perpetuated by the same powers that it's a global thing it's a very it was a very profitable business, slavery, and people are upset that they're not making money of, off of us and our ancestors anymore. So when you talk about the, the erasure of blackness, it comes from the same people. Media in Spanish is dominated by Spain. Spain is a, a European white country that happens to speak Spanish. And it's, for me, you know, it's a very interesting thing because for me, People identify me with my colonizer in Spanish because we speak the same language, but they don't do that in America, in American culture. Like people don't, don't look at you because you speak English and think that you are the same as a German person, right? Or, but for me, because I speak the same language as Rosalia, they group us in the same. And that's not, we're not the same. Those are white people who speak Spanish. And we're, we're not the same. And so that anti-blackness that you see and when you see people, it, it is rooted in fear of these people who want to survive that are told, if you're this, you're going to move backwards. Right. And a lot of these people don't have education. My grandmother was illiterate. She never went to school. And so this information that's being given to them is rooted in fear. And it all services the big thing of the big white supremacy Com complex that is designed to keep us down because it's been very profitable for them. Right. And if we keep, if we, if you got Mexicans and black people fighting in LA and you got Dominicans and Puerto Ricans fighting in New York and you got Cubans fighting, you know, Honduran, Venezuelans in Miami, then you, uh, you have the potential to maintain this pow powerful structure going forever because there's no you, no solidarity and unity and people are fighting over who got curly hair who's got a keener nose who got thin lips whose grandfather father was a real spaniard like all that foolishness mm -hmm. we just continue to thrive uh, not thr not even thrive is not even the word we continue to just bask in struggle and it just keeps us very you know so when you talk about puerto rico the dominican republic and cuba which i'm familiar with mm -hmm. you'll hear you gotta advance the race you got marry white so that you move forward do you they know? really tell people that yes they do adelantar la raza that you know uh, marry yourself a white guy and or you know that way you, your last name changes your, the children get lighter and you assimilate into whiteness uh, which they Many of them just perceive as survival and upward mobility. It right. ain't even, a, it, it's not even about humanity. It's just about how do we get these people off of us? Mm. You know, because they come here and they're treated like second class citizens. They're berated. You know, my grandmother was hosed during the civil rights movement. She didn't even speak English. She was in Connecticut. She got, you know, dogs chased her. So in per their perception, and my grandmother didn't. She married a Puerto Rican man. She wasn't into that. But per their perception is we're, our life is going to get better and they're going to get off of us. And, and the reason that is so different from Black Americans is because that is to assimilate as a Black person in this country, it takes a little bit longer if you're a little bit darker. But when you come here from uh, Venezuela and you already have blonde hair and blue eyes and you just have the accent and the surname marrying somebody white, gets you a little closer to what you think is arriving, you know? And right. and it's really, it's sad. It's very sad. But it's the conditioning, you know? And that's why I appreciate conversations like these, you know? Because it's like, where can, you know, we don't really hear a lot of these, you know, tough conversations mm -hmm. um, about identity and race and assimilation and American culture and white supremacy. Um, so... 
one thing I wanted to talk to you about was um, you did the stand up routine mm -hmm. where um, you talked about your stepfather mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and an incident where he got into it with a black man at the bus stop that he had splashed with his car mm -hmm. and then the light turned red and then they started they started mm -hmm. fighting um, because you're, the guy told him to go back where he came from. And um, you said that your stepdad basically got, got beat up that day. Mm -hmm. Why was it so liberating for you to see your stepfather get handled by a black man like that? Well, first and foremost, um, you know, I was constantly being given these this messaging about me being... See, it's all relative, right? Mm -hmm. I'm the dark one in my family. So it was always pointed out. And um, from him, him and his side of the family, that there was some something black that was in me because I was uh, my features were different than my siblings. But not just that; it's just I always um, I grew up completely in a black and brown neighborhood, right? I went to school. I went to Kelsey Farr, Comstock, Jackson, Alapata. What city and state? Miami. In Miami. So these are schools that are predominantly black and brown. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with all my friends being black, American or Latinos, and many of us were Afro-Latinos. I never, my perception of blackness was not that of less than. It was these my, this my, these my family, this my people. We, we all, when they come through here and harass us, they don't be pushing me to the side and be like, oh, that's a little poor. We were all the same. So when I see, you know, and I hear about this attitude towards black people, was always that was always something that was not in me and it was always a problem because I always was like why it was always like why do you always want to be with them I am Puerto Rican Dominican raised in Miami Florida between Miami and New York I'm American too and America is part of my cultural experience I'm listening to hip-hop you know I'm listening to r and I'm listening to it's not just Salsa. This is my community. This is where I grew up. Luke is from Miami. Uh, um, that's the DJ in my middle school dance. Like I, this is a, this cultural experience that's American is also my own. Mm -hmm. And so I never felt like anybody was less than. So when this attitude about blackness, us being better than them, it was, it never resonated with me. And so you damn right you should beat his ass. Like, you you know what I mean? I was just like, you can't just be going around treating people. You in the same condition, if not even worse. What is it that what is it that makes you better than that person? You, the fact that you have lighter skin, like, where does that come from? It's insanity to me. You know, you know, like when I I, I mean, I remember pissing people off when I went home because I was like, so do the light skinned people get more food stamps than the dark skin? I didn't think so. What is it that makes you feel, where do you get that from? You know, like, why do you walk around? The war on us is so harsh. Like, why, why do you have time to do this to somebody who's, you should be locking arms with. And so to see him and to hear, you know, the beat down was symbolic of something that needed to happen, a reckoning and a lesson that, you know, you don't, you treat people like people. And I've always felt that way, even as a little child. So growing up, what comedians made you see yourself on stage? You know, the first comedian experience that I had in Spanish was this Cuban comedian. He was a, a joke comic, right? And and my stepfather used to listen to him. It was this Cuban man named Alvarez Hede. And, um, you know, I used to listen to him because they used to listen to him and he'd do these jokes. The first time I heard Richard Pryor, my uncle exposed me to, my, my youngest uncle used to let, expose me to hip hop. Like he would be like, just come in here and listen. As a little kid to be able to listen to somebody grown talking about his getting high and his dog. I laughed so hard and I was like, man, like I, I, what is this? It was magic for me. It was, it was um, euphoric. Um, and so he was my first experience with comedy where it made me say, made me interested in it and saying, I want to do that. I would take the broomstick and tell jokes to my mom. Um, and then, you know, I, I, I watched comedy my whole life and, you know, I remember, um, seeing 
um, you know, some more and seeing this woman named Chocolate that was in out of Atlanta, that was like a beautiful woman that was also funny and dressed pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, like that was a thing for me that I was like, I like the women who were funny and, and, and were affirmed their femininity, which was the space that I wanted to be in. Cause I used to watch Lucy and I used to be like, yo, Lucy is cutting a fool, but she got on a cute dress. I love Lucy. Yeah. I love that me, show. Yeah, me too. I love her. But always beautiful, right? She yeah. was always pretty, always dressed nice and, and still funny. And, um, and then you think about like, uh, Thelma was pretty, right? Or mm -hmm. and Wilona was always had on her her getups, mm -hmm. and you look. Helen was always dressed nice on the Jeffersons, and I, I gravitated to that combination of funny and feminine, mm -hmm. and that's what I what I always wanted to do. So I just remember my journey. But George Carlin was a, a very big <laughs> deal for me because, you know, like when I would think comedy should always be this. And then he was talking about conditions and things that I, I became aware of as I got older. Mm -hmm. um, just being able to watch funny people and it, it just, those 70s, 80s sitcoms had a very big impact on me. Mm -hmm. And I always was like, I, I want to be in that world. That's what I want to do. Like, I want to I want to make people laugh and I want to make people feel good because mm -hmm. I know how hard it was. You know, I lived in in how hard it was. And it was those things that made me, you know, took me away from my conditions at the time. You were the first Latina woman to do Shaq's all-star comedy show? I think, yeah, I was the only person to, only Latin person to do it. What was that experience like for you and how did you get involved with that? It was great because I wanted to do it. You know, I used to watch him, right? And I thought it was so funny and Kevin Hart blew up from that, right? And you know, seeing like people that I respected in comedy. Um, and I said I was going to do it. I remember declaring that I was going to do it and always hearing people say, you crazy girl, you're never going to do that. Like, first of all, you don't, you're not a man and then you ain't black American and you're not going to do it. Um, it was Tamara Goins who saw me perform one day and she said, this is, this is my voice. Like I, she's like, I've never seen someone speak for me. Like, and we were grown women that had kids, teenagers that were, you know, challenging. You know, she, they, her and Val Benning put me on tour with the, to try out. And I was, I went on the road um, with D. Ray and Michael Blackson and Gary Owen and, and Bill Bellamy and Tommy Davidson and Tony Roberts and so on and so forth. And I had to earn my stripes and I did, I toured for a lot, for a while. And then I, I finally booked it and it felt good. I was so happy to do it. It was something that I always wanted to do. It was symbolic for me. It also meant something to be a part of that. Like for me, it's historical. You know, it was, it was just a stamp of comedy that I wanted to have. And I was very happy to do it. So you also had the opportunity to open for Paul Mooney during mm -hmm. the early years of your career. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Um, how was Paul Mooney as a person? Was there a difference between him on the stage and off the stage? No. And that was what was so uh, dynamic about him. He was exactly who he was on stage. He was funny. Matter of fact, like very like, eh, da, 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 da. it was very uh, interesting. It was, it was very a big deal for me. You know, the, the day that um, I booked it, Lunell called me and Lunell was like, uh, I got I got a call from Lunell um, and Robin. Uh, I forgot Robin's last name, but Robin is a comedian from New York as well. They they both called me and said congratulations, welcome. Uh, they had all opened for Paul Mooney, and they were like, you know, welcome to the club or whatever. It was really, you know, I watched him. I watched him every single show he did. I sat in the audience in the back and the bar at the Sacramento Punchline when I first did it. And I watched him and I was in awe of the, he was bold, you know, he was bold and, and sad to say for me that we would have to characterize someone being transparent, honest, and truthful as bold, but it was, it felt bold. There were so many white people in the audience <laughs> and he was just confronting them. Like, it was like, in your face, this is what I think about you, and to watch them get up and walk out. 
you know, was just like, and it didn't phase him at all. He was sucking on lemons and spitting the seeds out into the audience. It was hilarious. And I was just like, I can't, I hope that one day I can get to the place, not when I'm spitting seeds on people, <laughs> but that I, um, that I feel that secure in my voice that I don't care at all who's bothered by what I have to say. And um, it was just, it was really, really interesting, you know. What do you remember um, most about Paul Mooney just as an individual? I know he's, you know, resting in peace right now. He loved black people. Hmm. He loved black people in a way that when he did his, everybody loves black people, but um, no, everybody wants to be black people, but nobody wants to be black people or whatever. Mm -hmm. I felt that his stand up, and you know, it's very complicated with these guys because people will say, um, you know, they always were messing with white women and they love black people so much, but why? Paul Mooney's wife was there with us that weekend and she was she was a black woman. Um, and my job was to, to see about her because she was suffering from um, some sort of uh, mental breakdown or whatever and I think it was some sort of dementia beautiful woman and it was this lady looked like she was in her 30s so it was weird to hear this but um I was um I was just sitting there thinking this is his advocacy this is his way of advocating for black people and speaking up and speaking out now during the later years the latter years he had become very immersed in pop culture and talking about like current events and, you know, celebrity and all that stuff. But I always felt that it was, you know, he was on the front line saying, you the problem. And it was, it was just very powerful to watch. I heard you say in an interview that all comedy comes from blackness. <laughs> you know, what's funny is that when I said that, when I was talking about, when you talk about fashion and you talk about um, music and you talk about even Bantu knots, which Mark Jacobs claimed after me growing up with people who had Nubian knots is what we called them in Miami in, in their heads for years. And it was just egregious. But, you know, I, I think that anything that's cultural that, that becomes fashionable begins in urban America. And when I said that, I'm like, I started comedy in the black rooms and I always, I always say thank you because I have a career because black people embraced me in comedy. Black American people could see my story and, and, and it would resonate. And, and there, there was Chuck All Star and there was the Comedy Union and the J Spot and Chocolate Sundays was the first stage I ever did. And I'll never forget that. Like before my own people embraced me, Black America embraced me and validated me so that I could go on to do other things like Last Comic Standing and HBO and Netflix. But when you go to my shows, Black women show up for me. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that. And, and yes, Latinos show up, Puerto Ricans and Dominicans, Cubans, Caribbean Latinos really show up for me. Mm -hmm. But... um it was black America, black comedy, black, the black comedy scene. I, I would did jokes and notes in Chicago where people would believe, wouldn't believe that a Puerto Rican would go to the South side of Chicago and did jokes. And them audiences showed up for me, Mary, they embraced me and, you know, we got to be real about it. And so when I think about comedy, when people get accused of stealing jokes and you look at whose jokes they're stealing is Bill Cosby or, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, people that you didn't think. And so I always pay homage to that. If you if you pay attention to a lot of comedians and different cultural experiences, they're emulating Black American comics and just revamping it for their cultural specific. And not that everybody does that, but I just think it's important to keep it real. Keep it, let's keep it a stack. <laughs> I love that. So you named your comedy um, special and tour the don't at me don't mm -hmm, at me mm -hmm. um does that have anything to do with you know the level of sensitivity that you know people um that some people have on social media yeah you know well you know the thing is it's not sens sensitivity anymore it's a certain level of power that you have when you know when people so i'm not a centrist 
when I politically where I stand is is I am a progressive, right? I believe in the abolition of, you know, all kinds of uh, every single kind of white supremacy. It needs to be gone. I am all about, you know, equity and inclusion and not in a performative way. Mm -hmm. I'm like, just get out of here. You know what I'm saying? That the labels are are great, but let's see it in action. Um, I, I stand where I, I believe that, you know, police brutality should not just be addressed, but eradicated. Like I, I'm, I stand on my uncle that raised me. That was my father was a gay, a gay man and a, a queer man of color. And, you know, I'm, I would be remiss if I participated in language that was hurtful and harmful to anybody just because they were different than me and felt different than me. That being said, a lot of people have appropriated these, um, appropriated these mission, this mission at, to make it about them. They're capitalizing on it. A lot of these activists, you know, I, I'm not an activist. When people call me that, I'm a stand-up comedian who uses my mic to speak to the things that, that activists are working on every day that you don't hear about. And I'd rather shine a light on them because they're the ones that are, they, they are the ones hitting the pavement on a daily basis. When I get called to HBO or go do a TV show, I step away from it. That's their day-to-day, -day, every single day showing up for the people. And so... I feel like a lot of people stepped into this realm of activism because things got dry. And during COVID, it was a, a very big opportunity to make money. And now here you are speaking up for the people and people calling out your name. And they're not calling out the name of the people who are going to do this when your TV show comes back or when you have an opportunity to go back out and be the performer that you are. And so I feel like a lot of people really appropriated the, the struggle and and it's and and became these bullies right like mm -hmm. um like i do my joke about a blind man that blind man asked me to do a joke about blind people because he felt excluded because he was like oh you didn't make fun of everybody because i was there asking you to make fun of me and you didn't right i did i was in dc this weekend this blind girl came up to me after the show and she was like thank you so much for doing a joke about blind people because i felt a part of it in the audience was a deaf woman who watched me on closed caption and came with her cousin. Her cousin translate was doing the ASL translation at the show because she wanted to see me, right? Um, and so I'm sitting there thinking, somebody got offended about my joke about blind people who could see, but the blind person was like, thank you for doing a joke about me. And that's what I was talking about. Like, if we're going to have uncomfortable conversations, you cannot weaponize what we're talking about if you really want to have the conversation. Right. We got to break it down. When when people talk about homosexuality in our communities and you see these comedians making jokes about it and then having to, you know, having to say whatever it is, I I have to say the truth. The truth is we grew up in communities where, that were homophobic and it is deeply rooted in what happened during slavery and it is in the DNA of the people. So when you hear somebody making a joke about it and about their fear about who about their kids being gay, it's all preservation. It's not m m malice. It's I don't want my kid to suffer because I know what my community does when it comes to this. And this makes me feel a certain way. And if we can't have a conversation about that, we're never going to get through it because now people are scared to talk about it. And that that brews back Bad, bad mojo. And now they, that I don't, I don't like gay people because gay people do this. I don't want to talk to them because every time you talk about the gay people, the gay people, you see the comedians all the time. That, right. But the truth is we're never having a real honest conversation about it. Right. And it's so important for us to talk about it because the same people who colonized us with Christianity that told us that that homosexuality was wrong are now the ones penalizing us for being homophobic later because we don't have the evolution and the experience you know my grandmother my grandmother's grandmother was a slave in puerto rico mm. that's how close it was right her grandmother was a slave my grandmother was illiterate my mother went to sixth grade so here i am the evolution and the dream of those ancestors and you expect me to be fully realized and caught up to everybody else when my grandmother couldn't read mm -hmm. and you know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm saying. Like, how do we get to those places? Right. And we cannot hang each other 
proverbially, right. Right. because we have to give ourselves and each other grace. That does not mean we have to excuse homophobia and transphobia right. and mistreat people. But the reality of it is that we got to have a lemon squeeze. Mm -hmm. And we don't. We don't. We just keep rolling over it. Grandmama don't know. My grandmother didn't know what a pronoun was. She was illiterate. She didn't know any parts of speech. Mm -hmm. So being able to explain that to her would be impossible. And I did a joke about it. And now I'm I'm being blamed for the violence against trans people and queer people. And I'm like, how does that get me being honest about, you know how many people said my grandmother too, my grandmother too, my grandmother too, right. all people from all walks of life. Right. So maybe that's a healthy thing to, for us to be able to break open this conversation so that our grandkids are now walking around beating up queer people and treating them. You know what I'm saying? So... So that's why, so don't at me as I don't want to hear that because I, I'm only one person and you can't, you cannot, the systemic ills of the world, you cannot pin on one person, right. no matter how famous they are or not famous they are. And I just feel like it's just become some people have, are projecting their own stuff onto it and because they can weaponize it. You know, that the, 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 you know how I had a conversation with a woman that was telling me that she was going to imply that somebody was inappropriate with her because she was pissed off with him. And I was like, you know, you could ruin that man's life because that's something you just can't come back from. And she was like, I know. And I was like, I don't ever want to be friends with this person. This is right. an evil human being. Right, right. Because the reality of it is, is that you're weaponizing something that's so serious. Mm -hmm. Right. And so when we think about uh, we're talking about our community, our communities. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of homophobia and transphobia in our communities. Yes. Right? Yes. But and it hasn't changed. So don't you think maybe we should have an honest right. conversation about it? Because right. pushing somebody in the corner is not going to fix it. Right. It's not. And and I, I I stand on the front lines for queer people. I want I don't want a little uh, girls and boys and non-binary children killing themselves at 11 because they're getting bullied at school. The numbers are really high. Yes. And so when you got these people talking to me online, telling me I'm the problem, well, I'm willing to have the conversation. We're not sweeping it under the rug. Right. And, and we're not likening everything to slavery and what's happened to black people in this country. Even there is, if there is their intersectionality with blackness and queerness, the, you know, there's a healthy conversation to be had about it all. Mm -hmm. But you, you can't just write off of black people all the time. Like, and it, it gets, you know, every single group has said this word is the, is the N word. And I'm like, but there's no history of, you know, like the, the historical context of what being black in America is, is real. And we can be, I'm, I'm the grand, the descendant of slaves. And yet, and still, it is uh, erot it, uh, exotic to be me in certain spaces. You know, when people sing so rap songs about, you know, Puerto Ricans and Puerto Rican and this and that and the other, it's erotic, it's exotic and erotic. And foreign. You know, and foreign, right? So there's a reality that I have a privilege in this that other people don't have. And we can have, my children are descendants of Caribbean slavery and chattel slavery. Mm. I can't shut down the other parts of them. It matters and it's real and it's really horrific what happened and we gotta be honest about it. And I just, I wanna have the honest conversations and if they wanna cancel me and they wanna come for me, they can. They just can't at me cause I block them. <laughs> Period. Okay, I love that, I love that. So. You mentioned, you know, raising um, biracial children. Mm -hmm. You have a son and a daughter. Mm -hmm. um, have you, how do you respond or talk to them about police brutality? You know, we just had, you know, the Tyree Nichols situation, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, with his beating death by Memphis police officers that were black, you know, agents of the system. And, you know, even with the George Floyd, you know, that was like a national movement. Um, how do you talk to your biracial children about police brutality? So my kids don't identify as biracial. They just oh, yeah. identify oh, yeah. as black. Yeah, sorry. Which is that. fine. No, it's okay. Um, my kids, my son, when he was 12, was pulled over by the cops here in L.A. And they put a gun to his head and made him get on his knees. Um, they wanted to know where he was going, him and his little Hawaiian friend. And they put the gun to the little Hawaiian boy. And they, it was um, traumatic for him. Uh, and he didn't tell me that until he was 16 because he was afraid to tell me because he knows that every time he walks out the house, I am in fear. Um, I've always been very honest with them about it. Um, I've always 
you know, unfortunately for us, we have to tell our children, you're, the only objective is survival in that moment. You don't worry about your dignity when you're amongst savages. If you think that you have to maintain your dignity for somebody who already sees you as less than human, it doesn't matter. Right. You don't, don't buck up. You know, I have to tell my son that my daughter, you know, it's a constant conversation that they've had, I've had to have with them since I was little. I was riding on La Brea coming uh, to the valley one day off of Hollywood and a cop pulled me over and asked my eight-year-old daughter if she was strapped. And she thought it was the seatbelt. She was like, I do have my seatbelt on. He said, no, but are you strapped? Wow. And I was like, was he trying to bait us into a situation where he could harm us or whatever? Who right. asked an eight-year-old little girl if she's strapped? Right. Um, so, you know, we have the conversation that, uh, you know, I... I was with my friends in DC. My friend is a police officer and she's a black Latin woman. And we had the comp, we talk about it. We talked about how, you know, the system is, they're all victims of it. Within the police department, she, they're feeling, you know, the racism, they're feeling the discrimination. Blue collar workers that are weaponized to fulfill agendas of people that you never get to see. Because we we do a, we, there's a lot of emphasis on police, but if you saw the wire, which we did a very good job at showing you the structures and how far up it goes, it's all servicing one agenda, right? And people who make the less money always are the most visible and the ones who carry the most weight. I'm so I have to talk to them about that because I want my kids to be alive, <laughs> and you know, every time they leave the house. The, the the duality of having black children, the reality of having black children is you got to worry about everybody. You got to worry about white supremacists. You got to worry about black on black crime because the because of the conditions of the of the community. So many of us hate ourselves and each other is the great the greatest way to commit suicide is to kill somebody who looks like you because you're not you're not wired to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. And then you got to worry about uh, police, you know, bad cops. You got to worry about everything when you have your ki black kids. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody else experiences that, you know, Latino people too. Like I, that little, guard, little boy that was killed, you know, shot in the back. That was a security guard. That was a baby. Andreas Guardado. Yes. Yeah. And all of this is just, it's just, it's, it's uh, taxing. It's exhausting. Right. It's this go to school, follow directions, do what you need to do so we can get out. We got to we got to we got to study. We got to. In addition to that, don't talk back to anybody. <laughs> don't join. You know, be careful with the gangs. Be careful. It's a lot. It's right. a lot. And we are just trying to survive. So in your comedy in comedy career, You've had the opportunity to build a friendship with Tiffany Haddish, mm -hmm. who you um, credit as being a close friend and a mentor of yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw you say that, you know, she was actually somebody that taught you how to grind as a comedian, yeah. and how to get to the to the money, right? Yeah. Um, where did you two first meet and what drew you to Tiffany as a person? Tiffany and I met at the CBS Diversity Showcase audition. Um and she came up to me and she introduced herself to me and I told her who I was and she was like, oh, I've been hearing about you, you know? And then we just proceeded to have a conversation about the, the state of comedy in, at the moment and how we were perceived because, you know, if somebody says, um, you're pretty, <laughs> which was is really even awkward for me to to say right now because I I love comedy so much for me I'm just a comedian you know like that whole I've never talked about how I look on stage like it's never it's always been corny to me like I've never had to assert you know like whatever flex or talk to anybody about I think I'm this I think I'm that but it's just weird it makes me cringe but um, she and I were talking about how to, she said somebody told her that I was. A pretty girl that was doing comedy and she was like explain, expressing some of the things that she had experienced as people perceiving her in that way as well and then we just became friends it was instant you know and uh, Tiffany and I had a very um we would she would host uh, shows and then I started doing the shows that she was hosting like at the Long Beach Laugh Factory at San Manuel and she was the first person that was like your time is money 
and don't let anybody, anytime they make you leave your house, make sure they pay you. You're good enough to get paid. And uh, we used to go to dinner. We used to have these dinners that we would do like um, all over the place. We would go to these, you know, new try new restaurants. Once we started being able to afford to eat at different places. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, she and I became fast friends and um, she, she, I learned a lot from her. I, I learned a lot from her, not just on stage and being relentless and vulnerable because she's, she can be very vulnerable on stage. Um, but also off stage and being able to speak and say, I need you to pay me for this. Do you have my money before I go on stage? I would be like scared to do that. <laughs> and she would be like, nah, the, don't get your money before you go on stage. Cause, mm -hmm. and make sure, you know, she'd make, tell them, give you cash, like stuff like that. Okay. She was very, very, um, generous with information. If she couldn't do a show, she would always recommend me for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really appreciate that from her. She, she's always done that. You also did the um, They Ready comedy mm -hmm. special. Um, can we just briefly talk a little bit about that? And, mm -hmm. um, that was a great experience. Mm -hmm. So first of all, she made sure we got paid by like our counterparts. We got, I always say she made us make sure we got paid like a white man in comedy, which was a blessing. She took a pay cut to make sure that we all were compensated properly for doing our first specials. Um, she told me she was going to do it earlier on. I thought she just blew up. She's never going to have time for this. <laughs> she kept her word. In the middle of everything that she had going on, she did it. Her, Wanda Sykes, and Paige Hurwitz assembled themselves. Um, Linda Mendoza, who is a Latina director, she directed the first season of They Ready. And it was a powerhouse of women that were, you know, marginalized women working towards creating something special. And, you know, I was with, I saw Flame yesterday and Shantae. Shantae and I are close. I mean, we talk very, very often. That's, that's my, one of my sisters. I've known Shantae since I started doing stand-up. Flame and I are, are very, we get along very well. I love Flame, you know, and I, uh, I had a, I was cool with everybody on Day Ready, honestly. Uh, April Macy and I have been very long friends for a very long time. She, Tiffany, and I were also very, we had our own little group of friendship. Like we were very close as well. So um, it was a great experience. They Ready is the first, is probably my favorite comedy I've ever, special I've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, it, I was in my bag, when I, as the children would say, but I felt very, that set was very special for me because that was my first like real special that was on Netflix. And um, I told stories there that I had never talked about before me being kidnapped by my mother and kidnapped by my grandmother. I never talked about it again. It was too painful to talk about and I was able to craft it into a set where I could get it out. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like that was the first place where people saw me and said, oh, I like her, she's funny. I understand, I feel I can relate to that story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Um, and I was able to get some social commentary in there that I really wanted to get in, in there about, um, you know, mis misogyny and 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 the, the struggle of women. Mm -hmm. But it was it was very special. So. Are you able to share anything briefly just about, you know, the circumstances with um, that led up to, you know, both of the times that you were kidnapped by your family members? Oh, yeah. No. So my mom took me from my father. Um, she was wounded because he had um, he was unfaithful to her. She was really young. She was a teenager and we were living in the Dominican Republic and there was a lot of beef with his family. And from what I understood, le legend when I went back was that his mother treated my mother very bad. And um, and so my mom just one day she left and she took me in he never saw me again. You know, they, my father thought that my last name was his last name. And it, and my mom got rich. She was like, you were Rodriguez now. You mm -hmm. belong to me. And I, uh, I didn't see him again until 2021, but it was, she made that decision. And, you know, I, I was, there was a moment where I was resentful towards my mom. Cause I was like, you know, just cause he cheated on you did me, he didn't want me. Right. But I just think that she just did the best that she could at the time. She was a kid and he was way older than her. And then my mom was, um, my mom and I were in New York. My mom was dating, was involved with a man who was wanted for murder and we were on, on the run. 
And so my grandmother figured out where I was and she came and she took me and she took me from my mom. She knew my mom couldn't call the police because she was with this man. And so she took me back to Miami and, and I went back and I started school and started a, a normal life. Um, and I was without my mom. And when people, when I tell people the story, they, they're always like, oh, I thought you got kidnapped by strangers. They don't realize how traumatic it is. That was my mom. My mother is my sun and my moon. To this day, everything to me. And they took me away from my mother and I didn't know if my mother was going to be die, she was going to get killed. It was very, very traumatic. Every night I cried myself to sleep waiting on my mother to come back. So, um, yeah, it was really hard. You mentioned that, you know, you saw your dad again after all that time in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned, you know, that your mom was really young, I think. I read that 15 and your dad was like 27. He was older than her, so, yeah. I called him. I, I was very... Uh, when I found out about that age difference, that was a big deal for me because I was okay. like, that was not cool. Right. You know, and um, and people will say to us, like in the Dominican Republic, that's very common. I'm like, that doesn't mean it's cool. Like right. common and cool are two different things. It's not okay. My mom was traumatized. <laughs> she was a child. Mm. You know, I had a lot. I'm writing about it. You know, it's just, it's not, I mean, I'm so tired of women being mistreated and it is just goes on as just, that's what it is. Right. You know, um, we are dehumanized globally. You know, if they, they will abort you if they know you're a woman in certain parts of the country. You know, women being circumcised beyond against their own will, like young girls being so close throughout the world. Women in, in the Middle East having to walk in front of men just in case there's a landmine, they blow up first. Like when you travel the world and you start understanding what's happening, the ills against women is just so... It's so unbearable sometimes. And so when I think about my mother and I advocate for her, you know, nobody was at that time just because that was normal. That was not OK. It was traumatic for her. She wasn't fully developed. She was not fully developed. And that was not OK. I probably just have like a couple of more questions. I want to ask you about the L.A. City Councilwoman. Nuri Martinez, did you hear about that? That she resigned. Yeah, 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 yeah. The fool, um, the clown. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of them. There's a bunch of them. It wasn't just her. Right. Um, but there's still one guy on there that Kevin. Yeah. He, he won't leave. He won't leave, but it's like, you know. Yeah, he's really bold. Um, and I want to ask you about response um about reparations from the Latino community. Just like what the proper sh response you think should be from the Latino community when it comes to black people getting reparations? Well, you know, that's none of our business. <laughs> We're not supposed to be commenting on whether black American people, I believe in reparations, I'm pro reparations. Also, if you really, if you wanna get technical with it. So Puerto Rico aside, cause Puerto Rico is a American territory. So the slaves that belong to uh, the slavery that took place in, Amer in in Puerto Rico was considered American slavery, right? That being us, uh, that being said, Spain owes uh, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and Cuba reparations. France owes Haiti reparations. Like the thing is, we don't have to dig in the American slavery bucket because what that does is absolve. A whole bunch of other nations that have enslaved people and made a lot of profit off of the wages. I mean, the work uh, and, the, and the hardships of a lot of people globally that have nothing to do with American slavery. American slavery is a very specific slavery that went on for a very long time. And it wasn't glamorized. Like, you know, you see Puerto Rican people and Jamaican people and Dominican people with their flags, even though I think that's the worst thing that ever happened to us. And I'm very well aware of like the that some of those flags were flags that were created by the people who were the revolutionaries fighting for freedom. But the Puerto Rican flag that that's that flag is not even the flag that you see in the mainstream. It's the flag that the American people say, no, this is y'all flag. Mm -hmm. So I think that when it comes to reparations, I think that. Why wouldn't you want to give people back or give people the money uh, that was 
so many lives, so much work, so much went into building these structures in the United States of America. So much is built on the backs. The wealth that a lot of these people have is built on the backs of slaves. Why would I be against reparations? You know, like for me, even if you try to like, I hear people trying to rationalize them and they'll say, well, what, what are they going to do if they give black people all this money now? Why would you even, what, what, I just don't understand, like, why would you be opposed to doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. And when it comes to me as a Puerto Rican Dominican, it's not, I feel like we should all be advocating for reparations. You know, the Dutch owe people money, like France, what they've done to Haiti, the, 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 the horrendous acts against Haiti because Haiti kicked down the door for slavery and they continue to pay for it every day. Like, why would you be against that? Like, I just don't understand that mentality. It makes, it gets on my nerves. And I know that when it comes to the politicians, mm -hmm. it's a political play. It ain't a humanitarian play. It's a, well, if they get this money, then this, why? I, that's why I don't mess with none of them. But what I'm saying is I don't understand why anybody would be against reparations. Um, I just feel like you should just sit down. <laughs> okay. So as we close out, um, you know, you live in LA now. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get your thoughts on you know, the L.A. City Council just recently went through a whole scandal situation mm -hmm. that led to um, the resignation of a Latina councilwoman, Nuri Martinez, um, after it was revealed that she um, not only was making negative remarks about um, a black kid, um, but that she was also talking negatively about Oaxacans. Yeah, the indigenous the, communities. That anti right back to the where we started, right? That that whole anti you know what's funny? Puerto Rico is uh the island of Puerto Rico was called Borinquen, right? That's why we say Boricua, which that was the name of the island that was the indigenous name, right? There's a movement there now where they they say the white Puerto Ricans, they they Puerto Rican, but they're not Boricuas because <laughs> they have Spanish blood. There's this like people saying and you know, although I know some Puerto Ricans who are white Puerto Ricans that are revolutionary to their souls and are fighting for all the Puerto Ricans, the black ones included, that's what happens with this division. People start pushing back and say, I don't want nothing to do with none of these people, right? The reality of it is, is that that was gross, but it was, it was so necessary to see that because that's, we caught them. Can you imagine it, uh, nationally? how many of these people are having conversations about indigenous and black people. Cause we know that we know there's an, a sentiment about it when black and brown women and indigenous women go missing at numbers and you don't hear about it in the media. Nobody cares about them. You know how many native women have died and disappeared and you never hear about it. So obviously it's in the, it's embedded in the culture. So I think it was necessary to happen so that it could create some awareness. But more importantly, for those people who say don't vote, it is important to vote, um, especially locally and regionally, because somebody put that lady in office. Yeah, because yeah. vo voting is important nationally and regionally. And even though a lot of people are like, we're not voting because Joe Biden ain't doing nothing for people of color. The truth is that the DA that was uh, in Florida during the George Zimmerman got case, Trayvon got voted out. Mm. Just like this woman got voted in. And we do need to care about who is regulating the funds for the education of our children. We need to care about who is going to be the chief of police. We need to care about where the money, the money, our tax dollars are going in, in terms and where they're really going. Like it's important to to care about your immediate community because those are the people that when you don't vote, the other people who think of you as less than vote those people in. And that that is a big problem. You know, um, I was I was like grossed out, but I wasn't surprised. You know, they're feeding this. There's a big agenda in, in Los Angeles to fuel hatred between Mexicans, specifically Central Americans and black people. It's very profitable. A lot of them are in jail. 
And it, 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 it goes all the way into the jails where you see, you hear how segregated everybody is. Right. It's very profitable mm -hmm. for our children who don't have the benefit of an education because the conditions are so poor and they go out into the streets and try to figure it out. You know, not to create excuses for a crime, but the reality of it is it's rooted in something. And I just think that when you think about that, it's like it just reminded me like that just fuels the fire, you know, and it and it, and it divide and con it divides and conquers and. I just, I work every day to hope to eradicate that. You know, I know this ain't been a funny interview. <laughs> it's a comedy hype, mm -hmm. but I feel like I, I take my comedy on stage mm -hmm. and in person, I'm a person. You know, I, I'm not on all the time. These are the things that drive my comedy. These conversations will spark some new jokes from my stand up. But I just think it's, per it's important for me to be a, a human being and be able to have conversations where I don't feel like I got to tap dance for laughs all the time because it just, I feel like a jester when I do that. And this is like my habit. This is me. This is where me being me. And then when I get on stage, I just, I, 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 there's another aspect of me. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate this. So, yeah. Definitely. Um, one thing that you're most proud of in your comedic journey so far? The one thing that I'm proud of the most in my comedic journey so far was taking my children to Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic so that they could see black people who look like them mm -hmm. and see a community that they've never been able to see before, and especially specifically here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, them being a part of my journey and sitting down with me when I wrote those jokes and being like, well, how about this? How about that? Like that's been, you know, the proudest thing for me in comedy is being able to bless my children. Um, you know, they went through the journey with me and we went through a lot. And so seeing them thrive and win and being able to have amazing experiences because comedy has created a way for us is the best thing ever for me. Well, Ida, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I really do appreciate it. And um, wait, wait, wait. I, I do want to say this. It, it'll be March. On February 21st, 22nd, some Morris comedy special came out on Netflix. And I think everybody should watch it. She self-produced it. It's like mm. one of six. And I just think it's important for women to advocate for other women. You don't have to get anything out of it. I, I've met some more one time. We're not friends. We don't talk. But I just think it's important for people to support and to create an awareness, especially when it's women of color that are on such a big platform. So if you're watching this, make sure you tune into Netflix and you hit them numbers for some more because she's she's paved the way for someone like me. And I think it's important for you to see what she's doing. 